come to arguably the most famous section in the book of Ecclesiastes. Many people might say that this is one of the most well-known passages in the whole Bible uh, because of these first eight verses. What I want us to see is that without the verses that follow, these first eight verses are fundamentally meaningless. And so in this passage, we're going to see how uh, Mr. Teacher is trying to make sense of time. The sermon that I preached from this section, I called, If Only I Had More Time. If you haven't yet done so, then I encourage you to just take some time to go read through this passage and spend some time praying that God would open your eyes to see and understand these glorious truths that he gives us in this passage. If you are new to this channel, then I encourage you to uh, subscribe and you'll get notifications when I post uh, further videos on, uh, this, on the passages that I preach at my local church. And as always, I'm just going to take some time to uh, show you what I've seen in this passage. As I said, these first eight verses are really the, the most famous verses in the book uh, because of uh, this poem all about time. So Mr. Teacher is reflecting on time and the things that happen here under the heavens. So again, he's taking an earthly view of life here on earth. We see that there is a time or a season for this and that. Obviously, he starts a time to be born and a time to die. So those brackets on either side of our existence here under the heavens on planet earth. And in between those two extremes, a whole lot of other times or seasons take place. Uh, the real problem in this section is this word die. Uh, we were introduced to it in the previous section. Uh, so in chapter 2, verse uh, 14 to 17, the reality of death really did um, plague Mr. Teacher. He couldn't make sense of uh, life on planet Earth because ultimately we die. And then what do the workers gain from their toil? Uh, but before we, we look at these very important verses that will help us to understand these verses rightly, I just want to make a couple of comments uh, about these verses. A few of the things uh, that he says, we need to understand what they mean within their original context. So a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them is talking about uh, times of war. And you can go and read up in 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 19 and 25. Uh, where we're told that when enemy, uh, when enemy lands were conquered, they would then, the enemies would then throw rocks on their fields, so the fields became unusable. It was a tactic in war. And then when the war was over, a time would come to gather those stones. So it's just important to understand that context of their day. And then one that's maybe a little bit more familiar, but still worth us having a look at a time to tear and a time to mend. Uh, the time to tear is what a person does in a time of sorrow. And just for some context on that, you can go and look at Genesis uh, 37, uh, verse 34, uh, the Joseph story where Jacob tore his clothes on the news that Joseph had been, or he thought Joseph had been eaten by wild animals. And so it's a, t a sign of deep sorrow when somebody tears, uh, but then there's also a time to mend. And in all of these, we see there's good times and bad times. If you think about the good times, the, the birth, uh, timing to plant, uh, and time to harvest, uproot, they, they can be good times. There's times of laughter and times to build, times to dance, uh, times of peace. So there's a whole lot of good things, times to love. But then there's also a whole lot of uh, bad times, the, the time to die, the ultimate bad time, but also to kill and to tear down and to mourn and to weep, uh, times to give up searching, uh, times for war. So this is a mix of good times and bad times. And I think these verses particularly resonate with us because this is the world we live in. Uh, we are living in a world in which we are constrained by the reality of time. Uh, between the time of our birth and the time of our death, we are within those constraints of time. And so the first section of this section is here in these first eight verses. 
But it's very important to see that these verses could, could have been written by an atheist, uh, somebody who doesn't believe in God. It's just a reflection on time in our world. And I think that's why the old 60s song by the birds is so popular. Uh, and these verses are even read at non-Christian funerals because there isn't anything particularly Christian about these opening verses. And so we need to read on. And these verses are going to help us to understand these verses with a much greater fullness. And just to help us with a bit of structure, uh, the next section starts uh, with a question, which we'll look at at the moment. And then in verses uh, 12 and 14, uh, we get two I know statements. And that helps us just to see that our structure we've got uh, verses 9 to 11 uh, as the central section and then 12 to the end of 15 as uh, the final section of this uh, textual unit. And here we see he's been thinking about time and here we see the real frustration that he has with time. And we're going to see that actually when he realizes certain things about God, it frees him to actually... Uh, enjoy time rightly. So as I said, these first eight verses are spoken of apart from God, but then God makes an appearance in the rest of the section, and he's the one who changes Mr. Teacher's view of time. Now this question in verse 9 is a question that we've seen already. This word toil is uh, an important Ecclesiastes word, and what to work is gain. We've already seen this question asked a couple of times. Uh, we saw it in chapter 1, verse 3, and in chapter 2, verse uh, 22. Uh, Mr. Teacher's already asked this question, what do people gain from all their toil? And from an earthly, under-the-sun perspective, bound between our, the time of our birth and the time of our death, the answer is we gain nothing. If we are just living earthly, under-the-heaven lives apart from God, we gain nothing from all our toil. And then we see, he says, I've seen the burden. Uh, this really did place a burden on his own heart as he realized that actually, uh, in the bigger scheme of things, apart from God, we gain nothing from all our toil. We see here that he says, but God has set eternity in the hearts of humans, and yet we can't fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And so this word eternity, uh, it's an interesting Hebrew word. And there is much a debate whether this is eternity outside of time or just eternity in the sense of the beginning and the end of time. Um, either way, I think the big thing that we need to see in these sections is that God himself is outside of time. Uh, he has set a uh, time in motion and what he does within time will endure forever. And God has set within the human heart uh, a sense that even though we have our own time to be born and die, we know that time is bigger than just our own time. We know that there was a history before we were born and we know that time will continue after we are dead. And we also have a sense of an eternity that is outside of time. When C.S. Lewis uh, thought about this word and reflected on it, he, he pushed us to think actually we have this longing built into us for another world, a world that is not going to end, a world that will last forever. But on one sense, as we reflect on the fact that our lives are time constrained, it, it, there is a sense in which this is burdensome. And Mr. Teacher feels that burden. But I think the very important thing to see is these two statements, what he knows. And these things actually change uh, everything about his, his view of life under the sun. And we see again that he says here, yeah, there is nothing better. Uh, that is the second time that we've seen those words. And this is another one of what we call the carpe diem statements. Uh, he is calling us to seize the day. 
So we saw at the end of chapter two, another statement that says there's nothing better. And here there's nothing better than for people to be happy, he says. Uh, to actually enjoy life and to do good. It's another repeated idea that we will see in this book uh, while they live. So enjoy life. That each of you should eat and drink and find satisfaction in your toil. And then he says, this is the gift of God. To actually enjoy the time that we are given between our birth and our death, to enjoy the time with all its ups and downs, the good times and the bad times, to make the most of this time is a gift from God. But the real key to this passage that helps us to understand it is the second I know statement. And most importantly, uh, these words here. God shows us that yes, we are constrained by time and he is sovereign over that time. Everything that he does will endure forever. He is outside of time as we know it. And he sets these realities before us so that people will fear him. That's the big point that we want to see in this section. God is absolutely sovereign and his purposes are meant to bring a sense of humble reverence and awe to, to those who he has made, who are constrained to the time that he is in control of. God does it so that people will fear him. When we live in reverent fear of God, then we will truly enjoy the time that he's given us under the heavens, time that is constrained between our birth and our death, there's nothing that we, we couldn't control the day of our birth and we can't control the day of our death. God has set the time for your birth and the time for your death. So fear him. Now this idea of fearing God is to live with reverence and awe before him. Now God's purpose for setting the time for things should lead us to a point of absolute dependence on him trusting him we are not in control of our time and that's okay because god is we can trust him to do the right thing at the right time he has made everything beautiful in its time uh, that's talking about god's beautiful timing god is in control and his timing won't always line up with our hoped for timing and that makes life under the sun burdensome at times but when we actually come to trust God's beautiful timing, when we really fear him, and then we can see time as a gift from him and we can enjoy it the way we were meant to enjoy it. Now, as we reflect on this passage as Christians, one of the most incredible things uh, that we see is that this God who is outside of time, at just the right time, did something extraordinary. Uh, he stepped into the world he had made he set a time when he would come and one passage that reflects on this is galatians 4 verse 4 which says that when the set time had come had fully come god sent his son when the set time had fully come god sent his son to be born of a woman a time to be born and then we also know, importantly, that when God came, he also set the time to die. And again, the Apostle Paul reflects on this in Romans 5, uh, verse 6, where he, see, he says, At just the right time, when we were still powerless, constrained within uh, a time to be born and a time to die, but actually constrained as sinners in that time, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now God's timing is beautiful. And as time-bound mortals who have been freed by Jesus, we, we are freed to use our time under the sun rightly. Another passage where Paul speaks about our time is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. Where, where Paul says, be very careful then how you live, 
not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time. You see, when we live in fear of God, trusting Him as the one who is sovereignly in control of our time, and when we see that in His big master plan, He stepped into time as the man Jesus in order to save us, this one who has put eternity in our hearts has made a way for us to be saved for eternity. When we see these things, then living in fear of God, he will help us to make the best use of our time. And that's actually much bigger than just eating and drinking and finding, finding satisfaction in our toil. That's a part of it. But when we see our time as a gift from God, he will help us to use our time in a way that will really matter a way that has the potential to echo into eternity. And so I think looking at just these first eight verses, uh, they, they don't give us a sense of great meaning of what to do with our time. But when we reflect on them uh, with verses 9 to 15 in mind, they show us that if we live in the fear of God, we can then use our time in a way that really matters. We have the potential to use our time in a way that will echo into eternity. And so this passage is really challenging us to think, how will I use my time in a way that will really matter? And so as you reflect on this, as you talk through this passage with others, I pray that God would open your eyes to see how you can use your time in a way that is truly significant, a way that will live beyond the time of your death and actually only the things that we do in our time for Christ will truly last. So may God strengthen us to use our time, our seasons in a way that will truly last, living in the fear of him, making the best use of our time so that what we do in our days will echo in eternity. Well, God bless as you take in further.